and, and uh, she works with grassroots it's organizations. And uh, then That's there's my uh, John Tamney oh. came last night. If you're at the party, he spoke. He was, he was awesome. Oh. And so I, I'm really proud of our relationship with FreedomWorks. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to and Noah. It's the battery. 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 My battery. My battery. All right. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's uh, my third year here. Um, I always enjoy coming out in January. Danny is that so far this has had a regulatory, the impact um, of these deregulatory actions has been about 20 or 30 billion per year in um, actions that companies don't need to take to comply with these regulations. So about 20 or 30 billion dollars a year which in the scope of the federal government is relatively small. However, um, just one example of an Obama-era regulation that we really hope we can repeal this year, it's in process, it's federal um, fuel standards for cars and light trucks. Apparently, this one regulation, if we were to repeal it, should have between 120 and $340 billion impacts wow. on the economy. So I mean, this is I mean, these are these are fuel standards. These are um, you know it, these types of things have major economic impacts. So if you want to look at that's just one example. The types of economic impacts that we can have are huge. It's estimated that the regulatory burden on the United States economy, and you know, these are not from laws, it's from regulations passed by federal agencies, is about two trillion a year. And that all that that two trillion a year is just, a mess, but it's, it's just pressing the brakes on the economy. Every regulation you repeal to remove that burden just allows the economy to move further and further ahead. Which brings me on to the next thing, piece of good news. Some of which you guys, I'm sure, have heard about the January jobs numbers: 304,000 new jobs in January, uh, which is excellent. The government shut down, which was supposed to mean the economy was going to collapse. It did not collapse, as far as I can tell. Uh, now, that, that was a widely publicized number, 304,000 new jobs in January. That's great. My understanding is there's been 5 million new jobs created since the Trump administration took office. Also great. However, what is awesome news is that um, a lot of these jobs, well, first of all, let's go through where these jobs were created. In January. So, leisure and hospitality, 74,000 jobs. Education and health services, 55,000 jobs. Construction, 52,000 jobs. Transportation and warehousing, 27,000 jobs. And mining and logging. Now, I'm from Oregon. My father uh, logged, uh, was a logger when he was a teenager uh, before going to college. Um, and you know, he always told me that logging would never come back. Well, apparently, mining and logging, there's 7,000 new jobs right. in that Whoa. sector, which is awesome. Um, and apparently, since Trump was elected, there have been 481,000 new manufacturing jobs, which is amazing. Um, but again, a lot of what you don't hear, so hourly earnings for employees, um, you know, part of the problem has been in the economy, it's not necessarily that you can't get a job, it's that, you know, you're not seeing wage growth. Well, wage growth last year rose 3.2%. The first time it's been over 3% in the 10 years, which is awesome. Um, you know, we want to be seeing better paying jobs, not just more jobs. So that's great news. But the best piece of news that I've seen about the economy, and I'm going to quote an article I read last night. The one statistic that is underrepresented in this is the share of newly employed workers who said they were not actively looking for work the previous month. So these are people who are re-entering the workforce. These are people who do not show up in 4% unemployment. These are people who stopped looking for jobs years ago and are starting to look for jobs again. That is a historic high. You have more than 7 in 10 newly employed workers this month that were not actively looking for a job last month. Wow. That is great news. This is what is, we are taking people away from uh, what Obama created was this underclass of people who just couldn't get a job and dropped out of society. And we are bringing those people back into the fold. That is the best news 
on the economy. Of other good news, um, and I have to speed things up. Um, you know, obviously we've had two Supreme Court appointments. We might have a third in this. You know, during this, uh, um, during Trump's first term, we'll see. Um, you know, he's working, doing the Lord's work on appointing judges, which will have impact for decades. So anyway, all great news. Fine. Let's go to the bad news, scary news. Um, so, Democrats are very good at doing what they promise when they get elected. <laughs> their, their craziest, the, the campaign promises they make to their base, they're usually very good at keeping those. Um, so I want to just highlight a few of the things that they're talking about doing in 2020. Have you guys heard of House Bill 1? Okay, so this is the For the People Act, which means you know it's not for the people. Um, it's essentially federalizing the electoral process. It's, um, and, and they're going to, it's public financing of elections, standardizing of rules, all sorts of really horrible things that essentially all boils down to them trying to take over the process so that Republicans just aren't able to win. Um, and so this isn't going to pass, but it's what they want to do, and it's what they would do if they controlled both uh, branches of Congress and you know, controlled the, the presidency. This is what they would do. Uh, they're going to be pushing for a Green New Deal if they win in 2020. Um, I mean, this is a huge jobs bill for, uh, it's a huge jobs bill and it's a huge, um, I mean, they're going to be trying to just shut down full plants. So, we're going to, I mean, they're going to be pushing for that. Medicare for all. It's going to cost $3 trillion a year and eliminate all private insurance. They want to do free college for all, which is insane. I guess it's an employment bill for liberal arts teachers. Um, they want to shut down Homeland Security. They want to have either, depending on who you listen to, a 70 or 90% income tax rate. And they want a wealth tax. Um, so they want to tax your net worth whether you earn money or not that year. Um, and then, you know, they're crazy on social issues that you guys have all seen this, this week in Virginia and New York. Uh, all horrible things. But I want to finish by saying that I think that these scary, and they're very scary, because they would ruin countless people's lives. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Their rhetoric and the fact that they cannot help themselves you know, they don't even control the Senate, but they are just acting like, you know, gosh, they're going to just ram through this legislative package that is all designed to take away all of our liberty and take away all of our money and give it to the government. Their overreach is our opportunity. Even people in liberal parts of Oregon do not want... People who work for Nike do not want to lose their private insurance, which is what would happen if we pass Medicare for All. Every single thing that the left is pushing has a very good counter-argument that you need to make, and you all need to be evangelicals in your community about this. You need to tell your neighbor about Medicare for All, and you need to ask your neighbor if they know what will result in their kids losing their private insurance through their employer. You need to ask your coworker if they know that the Green New Deal would make buying a car so expensive that it would probably need to take the bus to and from work. <laughs> and make, by the way, flying so expensive that they would need to save up for years to be able to go and see their grandkids two states over in Utah. That's what these Democrat bills would do. So please spread the word, be evangelical about what we're trying to do, because the stakes could not be higher. I want to thank you guys for coming today. I want to thank you guys for doing what you do. Keep up the good work. Keep the, keep the faith. Keep doing what you're doing. And thank you all for being here. Before we get uh, going with the breakout sessions, and we're actually on time, how about that? We're on time. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, former state representative Jeff Krupp, who just came in. He's going to be leading a couple of training sessions today. I want to recognize him because uh, I think if it wasn't for Jeff, there would be no WLN. When I worked at the Oregon legislature, 
Um, Jeff saw what I had done, and he saw my libertarian run for governor in 98, and he hired me as the grassroots director for Oregon Americans for Prosperity. And over the course, Jeff, Matt Evans, and myself, we organized 32 chapters around the state. And then uh, AFP had a change in direction, and they pulled out of Oregon and Washington and a lot of other states. But uh, I didn't want to see that network go away. And that was the impetus for Western Liberty Network. Um, one big difference between those organizations, which are fine organizations, and Western Liberty Network, is that we don't have subordinate chapters. Subordinate chapters have to file 50, obey 501c3 restrictions and all of those other things. We have what are called independent affiliates. We have an attorney who wrote an agreement that defines the relationship between Western Liberty Network and existing organizations. And that agreement says that we offer training and they agree to make training opportunities known to their rank and file members. But other than that, the two organizations are separate, independent, and apart. So they get the benefits of being in the network, but they get all the independence that they want in the work that they do in their community. So for all that you have done, thank you, Jeff. And finally, in your packet, you're going to find these things. It's a rainbow of pages. These are um, evaluation forms. The first one is where you can evaluate featured speakers, but I've got a question. How did you find out about this conference? I'd like you to fill that out. We tried a variety of things, and a lot of work, apparently, to get the word out, and so we'd like to find out what worked and what didn't. And then there's a breakout, there's an evaluation